Okay, let's get started. It looks like the numbers of people entering are pretty flat at this point. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Judith Greenberg. I'm Deputy Director of NIGMS. And I'm pleased to welcome all of you to another one of our NIGMS webinars for trainees and for others. We organize these webinars to give you some interesting perspectives on a variety of science-related topics at a time when we know most of you cannot be in your labs, even though that's probably where you'd rather be right now. Um, before we begin, I wanna thank a number of people who've made these webinars possible. Um, first of all, the uh, communications team at NIGMS who publicize these so well, uh, to our IT people who've done a fabulous job in um, all the technology and, and making them work so well. I also want to thank all of you who are participating in this and of course uh, most of all our speakers who've taken their time to put together interesting presentations. Today's webinar is entitled Integration of Behavioral and Biomedical Sciences at the NIH which we think is an important area and not always well understood. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, Dr. Bill Riley, I wanna just say a word or two about the logistics of the webinar. Um, Dr. Riley is gonna speak for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then after that, we'll open it up to questions. If you have a question, and we hope you'll have lots of questions, uh, the way to ask them is to uh, enter the question in the chat box addressed to me, to Judith Greenberg, and um, you can put them in during uh, Dr. Riley's talk or afterwards whenever you think of a question. Um, and we'll try to cover as many of them as we possibly can. I want to remind everybody that the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the NIGMS website in about a week, along with the webinars um, that we've had uh, up until this point. Okay, now to my introduction of Dr. Riley. Uh, I'm going to be brief because I know he's going to tell us something about his own career path that brought him to his current position as Associate Director for Behavioral and Social Sciences Research and the Director of the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research, uh, OBSSR, at NIH, uh, where, he, uh, where he's been in that position for the last five years. He's also uh, been in other parts of NIH for a total of 15 years. So during that time, he was also um, at the National Institute of Mental Health, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and the National Cancer Institute. He holds an appointment at the George Washington University in their School of Public Health, and uh, his research interests include behavioral assessment, technology-based interventions for health risk factors, and the application of engineering and computer science methodologies to the behavioral sciences. Dr. Riley holds a PhD in clinical psychology. And so now let me turn it over to him, Dr. Riley. Judith, thank you so much. And thank all of you for attending. Um, it's wonderful to be here and actually quite an honor. It's um, um, very nice for both John and Judith to, um, to invite me to do this. Um, I've long admired the T32 program at and IGMS, and particularly the efforts in integrating behavioral and biomedical sciences. So I'm looking forward to doing this, and hopefully we can stimulate some discussion as we move forward. Uh, so let me begin with sort of a brief history of both OBSSR and, um, as Judith said, maybe a brief history of me and my career. Um, so OBSSR has been open since 1995. This is our 25th anniversary. Uh, we coordinate behavioral and social science research across the NIH. Um, our Roles are many, but primarily leading trans NIH behavioral and social science research initiatives, conducting workshops in emerging areas, supporting training, and of course, co funding uh, institute and center uh, grants. Um, OBSSR doesn't fund grants directly, but we work with their IC partners to do that work. 
So a brief history of me, I was reflecting on this and I usually tell people about the fact that I've moved from position to position, mostly out of opportunities that have arisen, but I have to start with a limitation for how I became a psychologist. Um, when I went to college, I originally wanted to be an astronomer. Um, I was one of the few um, guys who took his date out into a field to look at the stars um, and actually looked at the stars with them when we got out there. Um, so, um, but as I started in, as a math major, um, and unfortunately, as the whiz kids were doing differential um, calculus in minutes, it was taking me hours to do the same problems. And I realized pretty quickly that my calling was probably not in mathematics. So um, I still have quite an interest in that. I just sort of do the work a little slower than others do. Um, I um, spent about 15 years in academic medical settings and some time in the research and development space, mostly in the um, uh, in computer science and engineering area. Um, this was back before the days of iPhones and we were doing portable handheld sort of devices, mostly to do um, health behavior change and behavioral assessment types of things in a more automated way. Um, as you just said, I've spent about 15 years at the NIH. Um, lastly, here at OBSSR, and I've been here about uh, uh, five years now. So a few just sort of backdrop about um, funding for behavioral and social science research at the NIH. Um, we've seen a growth in funding pretty much every year over the last five years, both in basic research and then overall um, in behavioral and social science research at the NIH. And that portfolio represents a little over 10% of the total um, NIH budget. Um, now keep in mind when we're counting this, we're counting anything that has a behavioral and social science component to it. So it's not that these are all prototypical behavioral or social science studies and projects. Um, most of them have some piece or component of it that's behavioral in nature, but that still represents a little over 10% of the overall um, NIH budget. And of the players, the largest ones in terms of, this is from last year, competitive um, behavioral and social science research funding by institute. Uh, NIA and NIMH usually battle it out. Oh, and this, but unfortunately this one blocked out the, the others. Um, so it kind of does every other, but um, some of those institutes tend to do the larger amounts, uh, NCI, NHLBI, NICHD, some of those other institutes also fund a fairly large amount. And I will just sort of note that even the ones that are kind of at the bottom or not at the bottom because they don't care about behavioral and social science research is partly the size of their um, portfolio overall as well. Um, we began a couple of years ago looking at um, kind of subcategories of the behavioral and social science research that we fund at the NIH. And as you'll see from this slide, um, we tend to do a fair amount of research and some basic research and attention and learning and memory. That's always been sort of a core uh, basic research foundational science at the NIH, as well as social processes and determinants, um, healthcare and disease management and mental health. Um, and then you can see some of the others as you go down the list. Um, we've had a strategic plan for about three or four years now, um, about three years now. Um, so three core um, strategic priorities for us or scientific priorities for us. One has been that we felt like for many years that the pipeline from basic to applied research in the behavioral and social sciences isn't as strong as it should be. Um, so we've been working to improve the tr uh, translation of basic research into applied behavioral intervention research um, over the last few years. The others in methods, measures, and data infrastructures, um, improving the way we go about measuring these behavioral and social phenomena, doing that more precisely and more accurately, as well as improved methodologies for understanding these um, phenomena. And then the other thing that's been a consistent concern for us has been the adoption of behavioral and social science research in the community. Um, I'm envious of the fact that the biomedical sciences have the FDA and have um, the systems in place to be able to implement into hospital systems. Part of the problem for the behavioral and social sciences is that we not only implement in healthcare systems, we also implement in communities and schools and policymakers and all kinds of other groups as well. And the ability to be able to foster adoption of the science in those areas is particularly important. I'll talk a bit in a, a little bit about sort of the, some of the COVID-19 related issues, but that's a good example where there's some 
very clear research in some areas of having to do with how do you manage pandemics, how do you deal with some of these things, how do you communicate risk. Um, and that science gets applied somewhat spottily depending upon who's doing the talking and how it's being done. So um, in the process of um, putting together a strategic plan, uh, we identified four transformative opportunities that uh, Dr. Collins and I wrote about a few years back in 2016. Um, and these really do kind of begin to get you thinking a bit about the integration of biomedical and behavioral sciences and other sciences as well. Um, one of the areas was in integrating neuroscience into the behavioral and social sciences and, and that connection, whether it's behavioral neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, social neuroscience, have all been, I think, great opportunities to wed those things together more than they previously had been. There's been a lot of transformative advances in measurement science. Uh, this includes sort of sensor technologies and some of the things we're doing now with phones and sensors and wearables and home-based sensors, those types of things, as well as actually just improvements in how we do patient reported outcomes and self-report um, work as well. There's been some really nice improvements in that area. Um, the digital intervention platforms, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, um, and our ability to be able to do our interventions with reach and scalability that we previously weren't able to do. As many of you know, most behavioral interventions are very labor intensive, resource intensive, mostly have been done in the past face to face, in person. We thought we were doing reach and scalability when we had group sessions instead of individual sessions. Um, but now that work has been ported to websites, mobile technologies, and a variety of other ways for us to be able to extend the reach and scalability of our interventions. And then we've had a lot of large-scale population cohorts and data integration efforts across those cohorts that have allowed us to answer questions we previously have not been able to answer. Um, the integration of biomedical and behavioral sciences has actually been a principle of OBSSR since its inception. Uh, this is an initial article from Norm Anderson, who was uh, the first OBSSR director uh, during its um, inception in the early days of OBSSR. Um, and he talked about the discoveries of behavioral and biomedical sciences being equally critical for health, but that knowledge of both of those need to be integrated for us to really advance. Um, and that's been a core theme of our office since its inception um, to move forward and integrate better the biomedical and behavioral sciences at the NIH. There are, of course, are some challenges to integrating uh, this work and doing transdisciplinary work. Um, for one, it's an interpretation of different languages. Um, we, we don't always use the same terminology and we actually, the worst is when we use the same terminology but mean different things um, as we say those. Um, often when I say mechanism with my biomedical colleagues, they're thinking about some process that occurs under the skin. And many times the mechanisms I'm talking about are mechanisms that actually reside in the environment among social interactions and those sorts of things as, as mechanisms. Um, we also have to check our scientific assumptions. We each have our own. Um, I've been fortunate in some ways that I have never worked in a psychology department in my entire career. I've always worked in medical centers or uh, the NIH was predominantly more biomedical in nature. And the only time I didn't work in those um, areas, I worked in a, a private firm that was primarily computer scientists and engineers. So I've never really had the luxury that I think my psychology department colleagues sometimes have of being able to talk to one another and just know that their scientific assumptions they all agree to already um, we have to kind of put those on the table and make sure we're clear about what those are. We also have to merge different research cultures. Um, research standards and accepted approaches um, are different among these various uh, dif disciplines. Um, causal inference and what we mean by causal inference and what is considered adequate um, justification or evidence for causal inference differs by um, these situations. Um, I, I would, if it weren't for the ethical constraints, it would be very nice um, to do a study in which I randomly assign uh, children at birth to adverse childhood events um, over the course of their lifetime and see what the impact is on their health. But that's obviously not something we can do, even though that would give us much better causal inference data on the impact of adverse negative events and the mechanisms of that on health. Um, so we have to come up with other ways of being able to do that. 
to seek sort of causal inference in that situation. The smoking cessation literature is actually, uh, and smoking literature is actually a pretty good um, example of that, not doing RCTs, but coming to an accepted sort of standard for causal inference. Um, we, we uh, as best as I can remember over the course of 50 years of smoking research, never really assigned people to smoke or not smoke, um, but we looked um, through a, a lot of ways of being able to control for potential confounds to be able to show a clear relationship between smoking and ultimate disease. And then our publication standards are also a little different. Um, uh, there are Nobel uh, laureates in economics um, that have maybe 50 publications. Now those publications are quite large, um, quite voluminous, um, but 50 publications in a cell biologist lab would be the kind of thing you would do in a couple of years, right? It just has to do with the difference in sort of the, the size of a research publication and what it means and how people tend to think about publications in that work. Um, computer science is another good example of that because um, their presentations in scientific society meetings actually is in a lot of ways carries as much weight, if not more weight than it does um, in uh, for publications where that's quite different in both the behavioral and biomedical sciences. And then we obviously have to know how to play well with others, be able to listen to each other, be able to try to understand each other's perspectives um, and work well together um, as we do that. There's one other piece of this though that I wanna make sure we cover. Um, and that's this concept that psychology and behavioral science is common sense. And this is one of the things that I think we often struggle with between, as we're sort of integrating behavioral and biomedical sciences. So let me just step back from this and kind of give you a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, everybody, uh, by evolution and all other factors are amateur behavioral theorists, you have to be. Um, it's how you come up with deciding how you're gonna predict the behavior of other human beings, what they're gonna do, how to sort of react to environments and those sorts of things. And so we, we build our own theories in our mind and in our head about how, we're, how we function and how other people function. But those own experiences are obviously idiosyncratic only to us and also cognitively biased in a variety of ways. Um, so, but everybody has those. Now, what some people I think believe is that behavioral scientists as a result of our career study, we may have a slightly better quote common sense regarding human behavior than some other people do. Um, I tend to reject that concept when it's possible maybe, but I think what really sets us apart as behavioral scientists is that we embrace the counterfactual of that common sense solution. Whatever it is that we think might be right, our first thought is maybe that's not right. Maybe there's an alternative hypothesis for why this person has engaged in that behavior. And then we subject those hypotheses to rigorous scientific tests. Um, so we tend to be, I think, as I talk to people that I consider to be really good at this field. They're the people who question everything that they think um, and every experience that they have um, to ensure that that's not an idiosyncratic or a biased perspective that they have about human behavior. Okay, um, I wanna give a few examples of some of the transdisciplinary research that's going on at the NIH. I'm gonna spend a little time on COVID-19 since it's so pressing right now. Um, but first I wanted to mention the BRAIN Initiative, which has been in phase one of the BRAIN Initiative, focused very much on uh, neurocircuitry and tools and instruments and capabilities to be able to assess that neurocircuitry in ways we've previously been unable to. And the BRAIN Initiative has been extremely um, successful at that work. As they shift to phase two, they shift to actually applying that work to um, combining those approaches into understanding cells and circuits and brain and behavior at the end of all of that. So one of the things that I, I'm really looking forward to in phase two of the brain initiative is the ability to be able to use those tools now to be able to understand from very elementary behaviors up to more complex behaviors and be able to map those. Now to be able to do that, we've over the course of the last decade or so have gotten extremely good at precise and accurate and temporally dense uh, neuroscience analysis and neuroscience measurement. We need to be able to step up to the plate on the behavioral side and provide an equal level of temporal density, precision, and accuracy on the behavioral end of that spectrum so that we can map these things together more carefully than we currently are able to do. 
Um, the HEAL initiative is another example of that trans the transdisciplinary research program. Um, this is the NIH HEAL initiative that last year awarded nearly a billion dollars um, in funding um, and a multi-pronged approach that includes behavioral sciences and important research questions in that area. And I've listed here some of the recently funded projects. Uh, one of the things we did in the early days of the HEAL initiative is people were talking about, you know, could we develop better um, analgesics for um, pain control? And could we de develop uh, better ways to sort of treat people with opioid dependence? Um, one of the things we wanted to make sure was clear is that there are significant social and behavioral factors associated both with chronic pain and with opioids and some of the research that needs to move in that area in order to improve our ability to treat opioid dependence and chronic pain as well. So the recently funded project of the HEAL initiative, I think you see a really nice sort of integration of biomedical and behavioral research, looking at things like acute to chronic pain signatures, uh, discovery and validation of biomarkers and endpoints, um, a really nice study looking at the healing communities and, and looking at um, opioid dependence more from a community-based sociological perspective and how to address that. Um, work within the justice community on opioid uh, research and treatment. Um, behavioral research to improve our medication-assisted treatments for opioid dependence and a number of other things like that. Um, so I think it, this has been a really nice example of integrating behavioral and biomedical research in a transdisciplinary way. Well, let me uh, finish by saying a little bit about COVID-19 and some of the things that um, I think are important here as well in terms of that same integration of biomedical and behavioral research. Um, I, in a, I said this in a blog recently and I said it in the perspective of this is a really simple way to think about it, um, but with my infectious disease colleagues, I often just say, you tell me what you need people to do and I'll tell them tell you how to help them do it. Like what sort of things will get them to do the things that we'd like for them to do. Keep in mind that most of the current mitigation efforts we have right now are social behavioral interventions, risk communication, hand washing, and social distancing. We need to be able to optimize adherence to those. Um, and every day on the TV, we see people who are not adhering to that. And how might we go about improving that adherence to social distancing? Balancing the cost and benefit with um, economic and social impacts. And then there's obviously some significant downstream health impacts from those economic and social impacts, especially in mental health and substance abuse, but also in um, physical conditions that have a significant psychosocial stress um, aspect to them as well. And then optimizing testing uptake and then thinking down the road, optimizing vaccine uptake. Um, so I, I won't go into detail on this slide, but because I've said most of this already, um, some of the mitigation efforts that are important and why they're important, our ability to actually do better modeling with better data, um, especially around some of the social and behavioral characteristics and economic impacts and social impacts um, that we need to be able to better measure um, and have better data. Right now, what we're doing is mostly using data from prior flu epidemics as the base by which we begin to do that. But as we move forward, we're beginning to pick up more data that improves our precision of these models. Um, let me move on here. The, the other that's been a real, um, I, I think, important component of this work that if you, th you think back to if this had happened 15 or 20 years ago, what would be our ability to deliver healthcare in a remote way? It would be uh, abysmal. Um, but because of the work that's been done in telehealth and digital health, mobile health, um, we have abilities to be able to automate a lot of what we do to offload and remotely um, provide access to healthcare in ways we've previously been unable to do, and to be able to reduce the healthcare disparities um, as a result of that. Now, one of the things we have to be careful about is that the same people who are most affected and most disparate in terms of health outcomes right now are also the people with less access to broadband and um, computer systems and mobile technologies to be able to um, access these things remotely. Um, so we need to be able to address those as well. Um, obviously, in the, the concept of doing testing, um, there's an important component here to think about that has, again, to do with social and behavioral research. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful that my biomedical colleagues are working um, steadily and hard and fast on improving the speed and the platforms by which we do um, testing uh, for SARS-CoV-2, but the 
The other part of that is to recognize that testing uptake is important. The assumption that once, someone, once we have adequate tests that people will of course want them is actually a poor assumption. Um, back in the 50s, um, we had, uh, the 1950s, we had tuberculosis um, screening buses. Um, they drove from community to community and did x-ray screens for tuberculosis to do screenings. And people realized after a while of doing that, that people weren't coming, they weren't being screened, they weren't using the facilities, that convenience alone was not sufficient to get people to uptake the screening behavior. And that was the birth of the health belief model and things like per perceived susceptibility and severity of illness and perceived benefits and barriers to testing that were important considerations as you're trying to improve the ability of people to uptake the testing that was gonna be provided. And then once the testing's occurred, you've got health literacy issues you need to deal with with interpretation, the effects of that on mitigation behavior. So for instance, if I test negative, does that now mean I feel comfortable breaking all the rules about hand washing and social distancing and other things in order to be able to do that? And then services and handoff and referral. And again, particularly in health disparate um, populations in which those referrals and resources are less, uh, less available. So if they end up in a situation in which they test positive, will they have those resources available to them? And if they don't, why would they then subsequently go through getting tested if it doesn't matter um, from their perspective? And then obviously, like I said, complicated in rural and underserved communities where that's even more of a, an issue to deal with. Um, I wanna to touch just briefly on psychosocial recovery um, from COVID-19. Um, there's a lot of research, obviously, now on um, the treatment and therapeutics and getting people through to recovery, but there's also a lot of work that we need to do on what happens to them post-recovery and during the recovery process. Not only physical recovery, but also psychosocial recovery. So we have some literature about post-intensive care syndrome in which people have difficulty with stress and depression and other sort of mental health factors as a result of coming out of intensive care and a fairly significant intensive care experience. But that's obviously exacerbated in the current situation by social isolation and the lack of family contact during those intensive care um, efforts under COVID-19. And then of course, as people recover issues of stigma and also survivor guilt of those who made it versus those who didn't. Um, so there's a lot of factors there that we need to be able to consider and be able to address as we integrate the biomedical and behavioral work together. Um, so just to briefly, just so people are aware of some of the things that are already out there, um, there's a number of urgent competitive and administrative supplements in COVID-19 going on right now, addressing a lot of the things that um, I just sort of walked you through. Um, OBSSR leads one of those, but a, a lot of the uh, specific institutes and centers have their own as well. Um, and so there's a lot of ways in which people who are existing, existing grantees of the NIH uh, can subsequently do more work in that area. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention um, briefly to all of you is that um, as this um, pandemic was coming along, we had people beginning to do surveys out in the field, and I was concerned we would have nothing but uh, one-off surveys of everybody asking a slightly different question about social distancing or hand washing or any of those other factors. And as a result of that, we would not be able to do any data integration or comparison between survey uh, samples. Um, so we quickly set up a survey item repository in which people could send in the surveys that they're fielding for COVID-19 related um, variables. And then we would post them and make them available so that others could borrow from that and use what's already out there and what's already being fielded. And we had those in two places, in the Zaster Research Response, um, the DR2, um, which is at NIEHS and with the National Library of Medicine, and then in the Phoenix Toolkit as well, there are COVID-19 protocols. So those are all posted for people to be able to use what's already out there and available as opposed to creating their own yet again. And let me just finish up by saying that I've, I've been feeling like I've been skating where the puck was, not where the puck is going. Um, and so I think we need to begin to think more forwardly about how we integrate behavioral sciences and the biomedical sciences related to COVID-19 whether it's the unwinding of the mitigation um, efforts that are currently going on or dealing with the backlog of elective care or helping families manage complicated bereavement and situations in which 
people have died, whether from COVID-19 or just from other causes, and have not been able to go through the natural sort of sociological bereavement process that we typically have, um, re recovery complications that we talked about. And then down the road, we're going to also have to be in to address, once we have a vaccine, vaccine hesitancy and concerns about the vaccine and people who spread misinformation about vaccinations and that sort of thing and being able to address that as well. So let me stop there. Um, you can find me easily. Um, this is my contact information um, and information about our office. Um, happy to um, respond to people um, if you have questions or concerns or anything, um, but I'll open it now back, Judith, to you for questions. Thank you, Bill. That was terrific. Um, please, if you have questions, put them in the chat box, address them to Judith Greenberg. Um, but I have uh, to start off, Bill, two closely related questions. Um, you talked a little about the challenge of merging the cultures, the biomedical and the behavioral. Um, and so the, the question is, um, the first part of the question is at NIH, for example, how, what do we do or what does your office do to bring together those two um, sides of research to integrate them? Uh, and let me ask the second part because it's probably all together. And that is for trainees who are trained in the behavioral research area. Um, how do they gain enough expertise in biomedical research uh, to be successful in biobehavioral research? Um, so maybe you can address it both from the, the researcher's point of view, but also trainees as they're thinking uh, in, in their futures. Yeah, that's a great question, Judith. Thank you. Um, as far as the um, research efforts and how the NIH does this, um, I think we've been very fortunate at the NIH that, um, um, you know, I think at the early stages of OBSSR, we had to sort of make the case that behavioral and social science was important at the NIH. I don't think we have to make that case now. And so um, I think I felt very fortunate that um, institute directors, NIH leadership, um, rank and file project officers across the span of the research that the NIH funds, whether they understand behavioral and social science specifically, they certainly understand its importance, they understand its value, they understand the potential for it to be integrated. Um, and that's been a very useful thing, at least in terms of receptivity to it, that I think has been useful. Um, and the other thing that I think, and this has been, a, I think, a problem for the behavioral and social scientists for some time, um, is we, d we don't act defensively. Um, you know, as an office, um, we go in and um, offer the things that we believe are useful to offer, try to be humble about it, not oversell what we think the behavioral sciences can do or can't do, um, and try to be very clear about that. Um, and um, in situations where I don't think we have much to offer, we say we don't have much to offer. In places where we think we do, we sort of offer that up. Um, but try to think of it more in a service mode. Um, and I think that's been really helpful for the office as we try to integrate some of this work. Um, so I, th I think that's at least how we've been doing it at the NIH in terms of doing that work. For trainees, I think it's really interesting. Um, I, I, I think it's important, I mean, this is almost like learning a language. Yes, you can study it in books all you want, but ultimately you've got to get in the trenches and you've got to work with biomedical colleagues and ask lots of questions, try to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it and what's going on. Um, and I think that's an important component of what we have to do. Being siloed in disciplines, I think is increasingly less likely to happen in most academic settings. Um, but even if you feel a little siloed, it's important to get out and take classes in other disciplines, learn from other areas, do that kind of work. That said, I still think you have to kind of get up to speed quickly in certain situations. Um, I remember, um, I felt pretty comfortable when I went to NIMH because I had been doing work for some time in the mental health area and in the health risk behavior area. And I felt pretty comfortable. You know, I'd worked mostly in psychiatry departments. I felt pretty comfortable when I get to the NIMH. My next move to NHLBI, um, I knew the, some of the same health risk behaviors are still important. But my understanding of cardiovascular science was next to nothing. And so 
Um, this will sound like I'm a, really a geek, but um, on the vacation I had between NIMH and NHLBI, um, I, I took the textbook of cardiovascular um, science and took it with me to the beach and I spent my week reading about cardiovascular function and cardiovascular diseases and all those sorts of things. Not necessarily because I wanted to understand it at the level that my cardiovascular research colleagues did, but at least understand the language and understand the, you know, the type of things that they think about and the things that they worry about. Um, and I think that's also important that you quickly immerse yourself in the work that you have to do with your biomedical colleagues and try to get up to speed. Read their literature, um, look at you know, research that you, know, you don't typically look at or read periodically. Um, and I think all of those things are important. Sticking with training for um, a minute, um, what are, are or are there other careers for students who, PhD students who are trained in the behavioral and social sciences other than um, research? Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of areas, I, and I think we actually helped sponsor along with NSF um, a few years back, a National Academies report on graduate training in the behavioral and social sciences. Um, that's worth people taking a look at. It's a, an easy workshop report to find on the National Academies page. Um, and our concern there was exactly what you're asking about, Judith, which is um, we continue to train as if we believe we're cloning more behavioral researchers, right? They're just gonna go into academia and do exactly what everybody else has done all this time. In reality, that's not what happens. Um, we have more and more social and behavioral scientists that go into the private sector now than ever did before, um, particularly um, in uh, some of the technology and computer science areas and that sort of thing. Um, so that's certainly one area where people have been doing this work and actually doing research is just not research that gets published, but research in um, human factor analysis and lots of other things like that. Um, there's obviously people who still do practice in the field, um, um, still also very important. Um, I was trained in the Boulder model in which research influenced practice and practice influenced research. Um, I don't know that um, that model has held up as well as it probably could, um, but I really do appreciate my colleagues who do both and um, there was a time when I actually did both, but it's a hard thing to do. It's hard to sort of be in practice and get the research done that you need to get done as well. Um, but I think that's a helpful way for people to think about um, that integration from research and practice also. Um, and then there's obviously government work, which I think most people don't think about, and policy work and those types of things. Um, so there's a lot of people that I know uh, who are behavioral and social scientists by training um, who are in more sort of government administrative positions and you would say, well, you know, what, what's the rationale there? But um, it's still mostly policy is really primarily trying changing human behavior just at a higher level than at an individual level and understanding how people function, how they behave, how policies will influence or impact them, um, what the consequences are, including the unintended consequences are all things that I think behavioral scientists have the ability to be able to do in that space as well. Okay, we have some obviously COVID-19 questions. Of course, yeah. um, And um, so one of the questions has to do with uh, what areas in um, research on um, COVID-19, and I assume this is behavioral research on COVID-19, um, do you think have been ignored or under discussed and how can people begin to improve um, data collection from minority communities such as incarcerated people or undocumented immigrants? Yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, there's so many, uh, <laughs> so many areas. I, I don't know that they've been ignored. I think there's different levels of prioritization um, as people think about this. I, I think for me, one of the things that struck me as this um, epidemic has moved along and as people have done what, from my perspective, are essentially social and behavioral interventions at the public health level. Um, one of the things that has struck me is that they eventually come to figure out what it is that the research would have told them has been in the research literature for 20 plus years, right? And so one of the things that I think gets ignored is that we're slower to make some of the um, implementations that we probably should make 
um, because people really aren't looking at the literature. They're still thinking of this as a common sense solution, right? As opposed to what does the research tell us about how to, you know, it, how people adhere to hand washing? And what does it tell us about paid sick leave and its impact on transmission rates um, and, re and reducing transmission rates from the flu epidemic and those sorts of things? I will tell you that one of the things that struck me um, in, the, in the early days of this epidemic, um, the, the Vice President Pence was saying at one point that he had talked to some governors and they were talking about the importance of paid sick leave. And I, I, you know, I had to like, like keep my head from exploding because there's truly 20 years of literature on the impact of paid sick leave on reducing transmission rates in the workplace. Um, it's there, we have some pretty decent data on how well it's quantified, those types of things. So um, if when you ask about sort of what's being ignored, a lot of times I think it's what's being ignored is research that's already out there that's not being adequately um, translated into policy and tr translated into the things that we need to be able to do. Um, on the other question about um, the particular populations, um, I, it's an area that the NIH has been really interested in, um, trying to see how do we do outreach in some of these areas um, where there have been particularly um, significant impacts. Um, incarcerated individuals is certainly one. Um, the, the issues having to do with um, the increases in rates um, among minorities, um, increasing rates of death from COVID-19 and those sorts of things. And trying to better understand, is that really our assumption right now is that that's mostly because of the comorbidities that they carry with them into being infected. But it might also have to do with access to care and it may have to do with how quickly they get in and all of those various sorts of things as well. So understanding that a little bit better, I think would be important also. Um, but I do think that the, the question about incarceration, incarcerated groups, if I step back from that a little bit, the, the thing that I think is important for all of us to think about is the community sociological sort of perspective about how it is that people you know, get infected and what goes on and the networking phenomena that are part of that, um, how people interconnect or don't interconnect, um, how they live together or don't live together. I mean, all of those factors are important in this transmission rate. Um, and if you look at most of our models, we use appropriately, because this is what models do, right? They simplify all of that into some basic sort of transmission rates. Um, and that's an area where I think, especially among um, the places where we had the biggest problem, which is groups that are housed together, nursing homes, incarcerated groups, prisons and jails, um, those sorts of things. Those are the places where, in retrospect, we could have moved a little quicker to stop that infection rate at an earlier time. Okay, turning to uh, another direction, um, you mentioned um, that one of the, I believe you said, one of the issues in your um, strategic plan was improving the pipeline mm -hmm. from basic to translational research. Mm -hmm. And so this is a two-part question again. Can you tell us what you mean by basic behavioral research and how do you propose to improve the pipeline? Yes. <laughs> In two words or less. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, basic behavioral research, um, you know, all the work that we've done um, in attention and learning and memory is one example. Um, I mean, most, most behavioral interventions are learning interventions, right? Um, understanding better how people learn, how they respond, the type of things that they, um, the incentive structures that work or don't work for them. Um, uh, recent research in self-regulation and attentional bias. Um, there's lots of research areas in the basic behavioral sciences um, that just have to do with understanding why behavior occurs and in what context and what are the factors that lead to people behaving or not behaving in certain ways. Um, so there's a large basic behavioral and social science research portfolio at the NIH, even a larger one at the National Science Foundation. Um, so that's the kind of research we're talking about. And in the early days of behavioral interventions, we drew from basic research to generate the behavioral interventions that we now currently do. Um, so when I was coming up in graduate school, um, I was learning about how to treat phobias and panic and obsessive compulsive disorder based on basic operant and 
social learning factors and uh, basic research in that area that led us to the interventions that we developed as a result of that. Um, we'd still do some of that, but I, I, my sense is that that translation is not as strong as it could be. And so um, one of the things that we're trying to do um, with our applied researchers, you have to kind of do this on both sides. One is to make sure that basic research is thinking about what's a plausible pathway to health and a health outcome that needs to be addressed so that we're targeting our basic research that we fund more clearly toward that pathway. Um, and that doesn't mean people have to always do translational research, but they have to, in the back of their mind, as basic scientists, at least think about a plausible pathway that will get us to some applied outcome, I think. And then on the applied side, one of the things that I think we need to do is incentivize researchers more to be able to um, pull from that basic research that's going on right now and develop novel and new strategies. Um, right now, I feel like we do too much applied research just basically adaptations of existing interventions. We tweak them, we modify them a little, we add this piece or we subtract that piece. But in terms of a new novel component that hasn't been done before, um, we don't have as much of that happening. So um, we've been beginning to work on how do we incentivize that a little bit more. And I think there'll be more that we'll be doing coming out in the next year or two that will have to do with that as well. Okay. Um for the participants out there, keep your questions coming in, please. We still have a few minutes and some more time. Um, but let me go on with questions that I have. Um, you mentioned just now NSF, so this is a good time to, to ask. Does OBSSR work with other government agencies? Um, and if so, how? Yeah, yeah. So we, we work with pretty much all the agencies that have a behavioral and social science component to them, which are quite a few. Um, we, we do have a close relationship with the National Science Foundation. Um, I serve as an ex officio member of their advisory council for their social, behavioral, and economic uh, directorate. Um, so we have that connection there, and we work with them on a couple of cross-cutting projects as well, um, including the graduate training um, effort with National Academies that I mentioned um, a while back. Um, we also have um, pretty considerable um, interagency work with the CDC, with HRSA, with AHRQ, with a lot of the sort of more um, applied and public health end of the spectrum um, in terms of adoption and improving adoption of some of the research that the NIH funds to try to improve that effort. So we've done some of that as well. And then there's actually an interagency group of social and behavioral scientists that began under the Office of Science and Technology Policy, but things have changed recently, but we've kept the group going which is just representatives from all the various agencies, education, justice, Department of Defense, et cetera. Um, and in all of those areas, there are people doing really interesting social and behavioral research and also applying that research to practice. Um, in the risk area, for instance, the people at NOAA and the people in the Weather Service and that sort of thing um, think about this pretty often. The people in environmental safety think about this pretty often. So those are all areas where um, I think there's a lot of interagency sort of interaction in this research space. Okay, thank you. Um, question about intramural mm -hmm. research in um, behavioral and social science. Which, which institutes and what kinds of things are they doing? Um, so there's a, a few. Um, I, I, I would tell you I wish there were more of in the intramural space and in, uh, social and behavioral science than we currently have. Um, but I think there's a good basic uh, group of uh, researchers in the intramural space doing this work. Um, NACRI has an entire branch um, looking at social and behavioral aspects of uh, genetic testing and various aspects having to do with um, like gene environment interactions, epigenetic research, that sort of thing. So there's a fairly strong group there. Um, there's a strong group at NIDA and NIAAA having to do with uh, addiction and uh, substance abuse and behavioral interventions for that, as well as behavioral assessment of those phenomena. Um, so there's a good group um, of people working in that area. There are some people more in the epi... Uh, survey um, modeling area, I hate the, the population health or research area. Um, and they're across the board. NIMHD has a strong group there. Uh, Fogarty has some people really doing some interesting modeling work in the behavioral sciences as well. Um, so there's, there's a 
spattering, I guess, across the various um, intramural groups um, doing this research. Um, and one of the things that our office has been working on is trying to get them connected and integrated with one another a little bit better. I think they all feel a little siloed in their own little institutes for the intramural space that they work in. So trying to connect them better and then once we have that, again, trying to integrate better with some of the biomedical research that's going on intramurally. Well. So you mentioned a couple of times the word modeling came up. Oh, well, yeah. Um, and we know that requires strong computational and statistical yeah. skills. Can you talk about whether and how behavioral um, training includes quantitative training? How much of this do students learn in yeah. their graduate studies? Um, they learn a lot, but I wish they would learn more. Um, I, I will say there was a, in the um, graduate studies meeting we had, one of the um, people was talking about their quantitative social science program. And I don't, nobody remembered um, from a few good men um, when it was asked whether, you know, it's grave danger and he said, is there another kind? You know, it, for me, is there, is there another kind of social science other than quantitative social science? I mean, at, at, the, at the basic level, um, I think we get left behind if we don't keep up with some of the kind of more cutting edge and advances in computational statistical um, modeling AI um, research that's going on and using those for social science and behavioral science research. Um, so one of the things I'm always telling trainees is whatever amount of quantitative research background you think you have is probably not enough and learn more. Um, I, I feel very rusty because um, it's been a long time, but um, you know, we've moved from statistical research, which is still a key base of the, you know, the statistical analyses that we do. And those of course have improved and advanced over time. The computational modeling approaches, I think I've seen behavioral and social scientists using that more and more. And that's great to see. And it also connects us to our computational neuroscience colleagues a little better as well. Um, so it's nice to see that work. Um, and that gets us more into the modeling space. And then the machine learning and AI approaches that have been going on um, has also been sort of a, a nice space where I've seen, particularly in the social sciences, some interesting work doing machine learning. Um, so in all of that, it's not that you have to know all of that. It sort of feels like to me the same as when I sort of read a cardiovascular textbook just to kind of make sure I cut up to speed. You don't have to be an AI specialist, but you've got to know the language. You've got to know what it's able to do. You've got to know what things are its weaknesses and strengths and be able to work with people who have those AI skills to be able to analyze the data. Okay. Um... You mentioned uh, the use of mobile devices mm -hmm. in, um, in various behavioral applications. Can you tell us a little more about that, especially in the current environment with COVID-19, how the use of mobile devices might expand for behavioral health? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, area near and dear to my heart. This is one of the areas I feel like I still have a little expertise in. After a while, you become sort of a ge generalist and can't remember what you had your expertise in. But, um, you know, this is, this is the mobile health space, I think, again, broadly defined. So it's not just smartphones, but smartphones and sensor technologies and wearables and that sort of thing as well, um, has really exploded and really, I think, created almost a paradigmatic change in how we assess behavior. Um, so that um, what we typically did was ask people primarily, or we had to do direct observation of what they did in, in most contexts. We now have this remote, unintrusive, fairly temporally dense way of observing people, but observing them via the sensor technologies and the other things we have available to us through smartphones and that sort of thing. So the ability to be able to sense behavior, sense the context of that behavior um, has really, I think, been a major change for the field. One of the projects that we lead right now is called the Intensive Health Behavior, no, Intensive Longitudinal Health Behavior Network. And there, that network specifically looks at um, using all the cutting edge technologies we currently have available to us to monitor behavior in a monitor context in real time as closely as possible and temporally densely as possible to better understand the factors that lead to change within people over time. Most of our data in the behavioral and social sciences is really individual differences between people and not differences within people over time. Um, and so 
it allows us to do a much more fine-grained analysis of behavior and its context and its mechanisms and the things that change it as we move forward. So I think that's been a really um, great boon in that area. And then of course, the other that people mostly think about is mobile health as a uh, remote scalable inter intervention um, and being able to use it for intervention purposes without having to have someone sitting right in front of you to be able to do that. Um, that has, in some cases, in some situations had good um, outcomes in other situations more mixed and more modest outcomes so i think there's a lot of work yet to do on how we improve um, the intervention that goes on remotely via mobile devices um, but i think there's a lot of promise that is still there and the other thing i would just mention about that marrying those two together does what we call just-in-time adaptive interventions um, in which, you know, we often talk about precision medicine being, you know, which is essentially basically a tailoring at baseline. We determine based on baseline data how we're going to treat this person. Adaptive interventions in the mobile space really is we're collecting in real time data about the person and their behavior and the context that they're in and adapting our intervention over the course of the intervention based upon the data that we're collecting. And actually, there's some AI um, um, integrations of that. Um, or applications of that that have been really interesting to see as well. So it's the marrying of sort of the intense behavioral assessment we can now do with those devices and then delivering interventions that adapt to that data as well. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot with this question. <laughs> um, in the last several years, what would you consider to be some of the great triumphs of uh, behavioral science? Yeah. Um, well, I think there's been quite a few. If you if you think through some of the things that have happened, um, I, I think um, you know we we've had sort of the old list. Let me start with a couple of the key ones there, right? So, um, I, I truly think that what we've done in terms of changing smoking behavior over the course of our lifetime has been a critical sort of triumph um, and continues to be so. The one that's now coming is can we do a similar sort of thing with these cigarettes? Um, you know, in the diabetes prevention space, um, that's been around for some time as well, but now out in the field and implemented in some regular basis um, to do diabetes prevention um, using some of these behavioral techniques. Um, I think some of the work um, having to do with um, interventions in um, mental health conditions, especially, I mean, we started with anxiety and depression, but some of the research now even in more severe um, conditions, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, some of that research I think has been um, really nice work. And again, I, I think one of the things that we've struggled with when you look at accomplishments is how much better those would be if they were fully implemented, if people actually did what the research sort of suggests that you ought to do in those situations. Um, our work in adherence, I think, has been uh, particularly in HIV. Um, and of course, the implementation effort right now in HIV is particularly around um, implementation of what we already know is effective. Um, so implementation science would be another area where I think there's been some triumphs there in both for biomedical interventions and behavioral interventions, how we go about making it more likely that people will implement them moving forward. I think we have time for one last question, and uh, this one goes back also to a, a career-related thing uh, having to do with um, a career at NIH in the behavioral sciences. And by this, I'm, I'm uh, guessing that the person is talking about uh, extramural mm -hmm. kinds of um, positions rather than intramural research. Can you say something about that? Yeah. Um... So there's um, a, a really nice cadre and network of social behavioral scientists that work at the NIH in the extramural setting. They work across almost all the institutes and centers. One of the nice things, as you can see from my um, career path, has been that you can bounce from institute to institute because social and behavioral sciences are applicable across a lot of those. Um, so you don't have to be institute specific or disease specific in the, where you think about potentially landing at the NIH. Um, and the only thing I'll mention as well, Judith, is when I left um, the private sector to come to the NIH, I thought, well, this will be a nice sabbatical. I'll do it for a few years, but I don't know that it's going to be that interesting, but I'll at least sort of learn how they work on the other side and I'll go back out. 
Um, and here I am 15 years later. So um, it, it, I think I found it particularly challenging and important and the ability to sort of shape the field and uh, work with the community more broadly. have just been a, a wonderful aspect of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, with that, uh, and we're glad that you're here and that you stayed. <laughs> and with that, I want to thank you very much. This was incredibly interesting. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you, Judith.